good afternoon. Um, can we turn that on? Yeah. Okay. Ah, good afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. For those of you who have not been shemalizing yet this season, welcome home. Two courses are running and we held university for a day on Saturday, so I know a good number of you have already been back to school. We're starting this semester's World Affairs Luncheon Series with what is arguably one of our greatest contributions to the world. And in these fraught times in our nation, it feels like we're having an adolescent identity crisis. <laughs> it is a fitting time to bring forward the gift of jazz and let it shine. And so we have a most appropriate expert on the subject with us today, Wayne Winborn, the executive director of the largest jazz archive in the world, housed at Rutgers University, Newark. My friendship with Wayne dates back many years and several jobs ago for both of us. He has held significant positions in a range of organizations, including the National Conference of Community and Justice. Uh, I always say it that way because otherwise it sounds like community injustice. <laughs> the Ford Foundation, Medgar Evers College, and Prudential Financial in Newark. Throughout the years, music has been more than an avocation with Wayne, from his service on the board of the Brooklyn Philharmonic to his deep-seated knowledge and appreciation of jazz. Today, he will give us some insights into the role of jazz in our democracy, what it has meant and means to us domestically, and what it has meant and means to the world. Please welcome Wayne. Thank you, Sandra, for that um, warm and obviously paid for by my mother introduction. <laughs> um, so y'all don't have to bear with me. Give me a couple of seconds to get some stuff straight here, and I wanna, I, I'll do a little bit of um, housekeeping with you. Um, uh, at the desk at the front, we didn't announce this ahead of time, there are catalogs. We have an exhibit up. We do have the largest archive of jazz in the world, Smithsonian notwithstanding. Um, and for the first time, we have an exhibit of highlights of the collection, and it's in the Paul Robeson Gallery in downtown Newark. Downtown Newark is undergoing a bit of a renaissance again. Um, we're, we're, we've been trying in Newark, and it's very exciting. Um, and for anyone who lives in a town that has under, undergone challenges and, and a bit of a downturn, it's, I think it's always exciting across the country when somebody's getting it together. So there's this beautiful new uh, gallery in the Haynes Building. Haynes was a big department store downtown. And their first exhibit, which is up through the end of the year, are highlights of our collection. I brought with me a few catalogs um, of that collection. I'm very proud of this book. The pieces that we have exhibited include everything from um, Dizzy, uh, Louis Armstrong's trumpet, one of them, to um, uh, Ella Fitzgerald's dress and her favorite wig, um, uh, mounted next to a video of her performing in that same dress and wig. She liked her wig, so this is not a bad thing. Um, so uh, there are a couple out there. They're free. Please take them. There, there are a number of essays in the book that I'm also very proud of that deal with the cross-section of issues in and around jazz. Um, we look at the history of jazz in Newark. is a huge jazz town. has a rich history and tradition in jazz. And also history of recorded music. It happens to be the uh, centennial of the first recording in 1917. I'll say a, a, just a quick thing about that in a second. So um, please grab those. I see the gentleman just has one in his hand. They're called... Is it the last one? Oh, sorry about that. You can share with your neighbor. No, I'm not sharing. Uh, well, if I have, uh, you can get in contact with me directly or through Sandra, and uh, I'll, I'll uh, send you a copy of the catalog. We're very proud of them. So, thank you again. Um, Sandra and Maury are uh, dear, dear friends and just wonderful, wonderful human beings. I think they are national treasures, quite honestly. Um, <laughs> And, and I know they're yours, Scranton, but you have to, you have to share them with the rest of the world. Um, Sandra and I have known each other for a very, very long time, and she is directly responsible for any number of wonderful things that have happened to me, um, including her uh, introducing me to, or I should say persistently introducing me to, my uh, beloved Trinija. Um, it took her, it took Sandra a couple of times. I'm a little slow on the uptake, um, but uh, Trinija's here, and uh, she, we, 
Mayenta. It's truly an honor to be with you this afternoon and to have the opportunity to share a few thoughts and perhaps insights on two of the greatest loves of my life, jazz and democracy. I'm particularly honored, not just because I have such love and respect for Sandra and all that she's doing here in Scranton and elsewhere, but also because I attended a Schemmel Forum a few years ago and the speaker was Clement Price, who was a distinguished professor of history at Rutgers University, Newark. Clem was a wonderful friend, a mentor to people like me, and just a really good man. He was also chair of the search committee for the position I now hold. And over dinner at Sandra and Maury's that evening after his talk, he encouraged me to apply for it. <laughs> we talked all evening about it, and although I was initially skeptical, I'm, I'm, I'm really giving you the PG-13 version. I was like, dude, that is not the gig for me. Um, but by the end of the evening, I was convinced. Um, but that was the last time I saw Clint, as he passed away unexpectedly a short time later. Um, despite that, his legacy and life live on in many, many ways. On campus, this was not a part of the job description, but on campus we have a, jazz, a new jazz club that I get to manage. Who knew? I like running a bar. Um, <laughs> and it's named for Clem. It's called Clement's Place. And um, it's, I'll just take a quick second to tell you this story. This, again, lots of renovation going on downtown. This is a former insurance building that's been renovated. And on the first floor in this space, um, apparently they were going to put a convenience store. <laughs> Uh, because their dorms on the third floor up and then the chancellor's residence on the, is on the top two floors. And Clem apparently was like, no, 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 you cannot put a convenience <laughs> store here. And so in his memory, uh, Clem loved good bars. He loved good jazz. He loved great conversation. Um, and so this, this uh, really special space um, is, is in his dedication. We have artwork from his home and we put, present world-class artists, we present local folks, we present young people, we present some of the old masters, and to a person, everyone has said to me, there's a special feeling. It's Newark, but it's beyond that, and so I'm very, very proud of that. Clem is also directly responsible, along with Sandra Mori, for me standing here before you, so you can blame all of them when, this is, you know, when the dust settles. What I thought I'd do today was give you a brief and completely inadequate overview of the history of jazz talk a little bit about where the music is today and some of the issues that play with it, draw some parallels to our democracy, and by then, having hopefully provoked some thoughts and reactions in you, engage a bit in conversation. Um, I'd like to leave a lot for conversation, so you can interrupt, um, uh, but I'm going to be sure to leave plenty of time. In fact, I think it's going to take me, I don't know if you guys do this a lot, but when you're preparing, it always feels like you don't have enough, and so I've just got like reams of paper. And, um, <laughs> And then you speed, then it turns out you have too much, you only get through a page or two. But I'm, I'm going to speed through this so we can really engage each other in a bit of a dialogue. Um, some 20 years ago, the critic and historian Stanley Dan suggested that the full story of jazz could not be properly told in less than five or six volumes. And I certainly can't do it justice today. So um, I'm going to skim over some things. I hope that you'll, when you notice that I've skimmed over some things, say, you know, a decade or four, um, you'll, you'll ask questions about those or make notes and we can talk about it a bit. So the music we call jazz comes out of the African American experience and has its earliest beginnings in what's often called pre-jazz. This includes field hollers, ring shouts, and the very earliest blues chants and shouts. Before the 19th century, during the French and Spanish colonial area, Congo Square in New Orleans, which is now Louis Armstrong Park, was one of many informal meeting places where enslaved Africans and free people of color would gather on Sunday afternoons to socialize, trade, sing, dance, and play music. This tradition continued when the United States purchased Louisiana from France at the beginning of the 19th century. However, in, in 1817, when the New Orleans City Council, along with the mayor at the time, designated Congo Square as the only acceptable place where slaves were allowed to gather, it became widely known that these musical celebrations were held on Sundays, and they attracted visitors from across the country. One such visitor was Benjamin Latrobe, a noted architect who happened to stumble upon Congo Square one Sunday afternoon while visiting New Orleans, who wrote and sketched detailed descriptions about what he saw. His is one of several first-hand accounts of white observers of the ring shouts and dances that enslaved Africans and free people of color practiced when they were able. Interestingly, these accounts often treat the music and dance as frivolous party activities or terrifyingly bizarre, and that is what New Orleans historian Neil Sublett has called, quote, tremendous acts of will, memory, and resistance. Latrobe wrote, 
An elderly black man sits astride a large cylindrical drum. Using his fingers in the edge of his hand, he jabs repeatedly at the drum head, which is around a foot in diameter and probably made from an animal skin, evoking a throbbing pulsation with rapid, sharp strokes. A second drummer, holding his instrument between his knees, joins in, playing the same staccato attack. A third man, seated on the ground, plucks at a string instrument, the body of which is roughly fashioned from a calabash. Another calabash has been made into a drum, and a woman beats at it with two short sticks. One voice, then others join in. A dance of seeming contradictions accompanies this musical give and take, a moving hieroglyph that appears. On the one hand, informal and spontaneous, yet on closer inspection, ritualized and precise. It is a dance of massive proportions. A dense crowd of dark bodies forms into circular groups, perhaps five or 600 individuals moving in time to the pulsations of the music, some swaying gently, others aggressively stomping their feet. A number of women in the group begin chanting. Latrobe also wrote that, quote, he had never, I'm sorry, quote, never had he seen anything so brutally savage. Now we see, I think you guys see what I saw in my mind's eye beauty, but he saw brutally savage. The cultivation and retention of such Africanness is essential to understanding the formation of jazz and the co-mingling of free and enslaved people of color is as central to the formation of jazz as is the blending of African and European harmonic languages, instruments, and rhythmic properties. So it was literally in Congo Square on Sundays that black people came together and affirmed and reinforced their respective humanity and personhood and reinforced their Africanness in the face of its denial. <laughs> Remember that most other southern states strictly prohibited the interactions of enslaved people and free people of color, and they tried to limit all expressions of anything remotely African. It was in Congo Square that the umpapa of European brass bands met the 6-4 groove of West Africa and produced the syncopation and rhythmic complexity that is central to New Orleans music and foundational to what we call jazz. So if you can think of umpapa, umpapa, and doom, 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 doom. That's how we get mm, 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 mm. And it makes you want to makes you want to move. This period early in the 19th century is what historian Ted Joya calls the beginning of quote the Africanization of American music and involved an actual transfer of totally African ritual to the native soil of the New World. This is a profoundly important moment and movement of cultural practice and adaptation reflective of a people's need to retain core components of their collective identity and their simultaneous grasp and mastery of the unwanted situation confronting them in a strange and new place. As an expression of hope and humanity, loss and longing and perseverance and patience, the music that emerged during this time reflected both the past and the future. It was both an oral and physical expression of the profound humanity of a people who were caught in a truly horrific and dehumanizing experience. Movement was fundamental to the music and the seamless relationship between performer and participant was sometimes was what sometimes startled white onlookers who were more accustomed to audiences being passive consumers of what they heard and solitary in their experience. The music would continue to develop over the course of the 19th century and would meld with other African-based music forms, bless you, all within the context of an American experience. Thus, work, work songs, field hollers, street cries, and levee camp hollers all would get added to the mix of what would become jazz as we know it. Another, another essential ingredient primarily associated with the rural South is the blues, of course. While there is some debate over whether or not the blues is strictly an African-American invention, or indeed has direct roots in Africa, particularly in Ghana, the importance of this music form to jazz is unquestioned nor is the role of African Americans in developing it on these shores. The essential ingredients of the blues are the use of the minor third and minor seventh as melodic devices. I didn't ask you if you all, folks, do you know music at all? There? You've already heard me hum. You don't want me to sing a major. You don't want me to sing a major third and a minor third. No, we don't want to do that. Uh, the minor third and the minor, and the minor seventh as melodic devices. This is an important distinction. Those, of course, minor sounding music had been used in classical music, of course, for centuries. But the use of it as a melodic device was in direct contradiction with classical music training at that point. More importantly, more importantly, this subtle shift in tonality in the service of melodic invention allows the performer to convey emotions such as melancholy, 
heartache and longing, among others. Now, focusing on the technical aspects of this music is important, and jazz nerds like me are notorious for doing so, sometimes to an extreme degree. This distillation of the blues to basically two notes, just two notes, altered by a half step each is technically accurate, but it's also an, an incredible oversimplification. Because while you can dissect with some degree of accuracy the notes being sung or played, and where they're being used in certain chord structure or harmonic contexts, there is still an elusive, ethereal quality that divides exact description. In other words, you can tell someone the right notes to sing or play, but you may feel absolutely nothing upon hearing them do so. Our analysis of how a performer made us react and feel is always post hoc. It's always in search of explanation for what is an immediate and visceral response to that performance. Further, simply talking about note choice and harmonic balance between dissonance and consonance, coupled with an often simple melody, doesn't begin to address the ability of the blues to fully express the pain and anguish of the human condition when faced with the reality of black life in white America during this time. The expressiveness of the blues form captured the experience of a people in a terrible situation and simultaneously captivated many of the people responsible for that situation. Thus is its power. Part of the problem with a lot of jazz being played today is just this. Musicians and singers, while skilled and technically proficient, communicate nothing of depth in their music, nothing noteworthy, nothing that touches the soul or expresses theirs. But more on that later. So we can see the earliest elements of jazz developing independently and then coming together over the course of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Field hollers, blues, ragtime, brass bands are all percolating in black communities and consciousness across the country. African Americans, just a half century away from having been enslaved, are striving and migrating from the South to the Midwest, to the North, and bringing their cultural selves with them. They are adapting and incorporating European instruments, styles, and harmonies and rhythms as they deem necessary to reflect their new lives and new possibilities. All of this growth and transition is occurring in the context of the Industrial Revolution. So you have the first piano rag published in 1892. And just seven years later, Scott Joplin's Maple Leaf Rag sells over 100,000 copies. 100,000 copies in 1899. It's extraordinary. And remember, this is published music at this point. We don't have recorded. Uh, at virtually every home or every other home has a piano. Mm -hmm. Young people learn to play, at least functionally. 100,000 copies. Duke Ellington was born that same year, by the way. The word jazz appears for the first time in print in 1913, in of all things, the San Francisco Bulletin announcing a performance. Two years later, Jelly Roll Morton publishes Jelly Roll's Blues, which is considered by many to be the first jazz composition. Meanwhile, W.C. Handy publishes St. Louis Blues, written in 1914, which would go on to become one of the most recorded songs in the 20th century. I believe it's the second most recorded song of the century after Silent Night, but I couldn't confirm that, so I don't want to. And in 1917, the all-white original Dixieland jazz brand records what is widely considered the first jazz album, although there are a few other all-white groups that could debate that. If you delve deeply into the first recordings of jazz, there's a bit of a controversy. There were a lot of, there's a lot of recording going on. There's great excitement around this new technology. And um, yes, the original Dixieland jazz band was all white, but it wasn't because of racist intent. There was a, there's a deeper story behind it in terms of the first band they were a part of, classic band stuff. Two of the guys didn't like the leader. They leave, form their own band. Fine, we don't like you. We're going to Chicago. Oh, there's a recording studio. Who knew? <laughs> by 1920, aided by technological advances in audio recording and an economic surge experienced in major cities, jazz becomes increasingly popular across the country. The next 80 years have seen the continued growth and development of jazz from ragtime and early jazz through the big band era, the Great Depression, the swing era, bebop, free jazz, modal jazz, the 1960s, I'm sorry, I thought I got something out of order. The 1960s and 70s fusion or jazz rock fusion and shifted in emphasis from city to city. Now New Orleans, Chicago, Kansas City, New York, all become important stylistic centers of jazz at different times and all contribute significantly to the continued evolution of the music. Similarly, major figures from Jolly Roll Morton and W.C. Handy to Fletcher Henderson, Earl Hines, Benny Goodman, Duke Ellington, James P. Johnson, Art Tatum, Willie the Lion Smith, 
Paul Whiteman, Bix Biedervik, Count Basie, Billy Holiday, Ella Fitzgerald, Coleman Hawkins, Dizzy Gillespie, Charlie Parker, Lester Young, Thelonious Monk, Charles Mingus, Bud Powell, Miles Ma Davis, Sonny Rollins, John Coltrane, Ornette Coleman, and many, many others all play important roles in the popularity and musical expansion of jazz. I apologize, there's so many music musicians, I know I left some of your favorites out. <laughs> and there's another category of what are considered to be, the, the, behind closed doors, people will call them the lesser cats, the lesser cats. Lesser not in terms of their um, ability, but rather in terms of the popularity and whether or not they became household names. There are a number of musicians like that who are important. I have a friend and colleague who gives a talk on the unknown figures of the 40s and 50s and 30s and 20s. And hopefully you'll get to, you're not telling me to stop, are you? No. Okay, um, hopefully you'll get to hear some of that. But of course, we come to one very important seminal figure in jazz, and that is Louis Armstrong, who is widely considered to be the single most influential figure in jazz to this day. He defined modern swing phrasing changed the conception of the band from collective improvisation to the now familiar soloist in a context. And he greatly influenced jazz singers after him as well as anyone who attempts to scat sing. His career spans the 1920s to the 1960s, and he was one of the first and most enduring crossover artists in the 20th century, appealing to black and white audiences as well as a global fan base. I want to play for you, um, and I apologize for this, it's going to take me a quick second. Um, one of the more important pieces I, I mentioned to Jason, the sound guy, when I asked him if he had this tune, he went looking for it and he didn't recognize what it was. And I said to him, you're clearly not a trumpet player. <laughs> I don't know anyone who, oh, wait, am I not on the internet? I, I should be on, right? Oh, this is going to be a problem. West End Blues is what I'm trying to find for you all. Um, bear with me one second because it says I'm on it, but I'm not. Oh, I hate this when it happens. Okay, wait. Okay. okay. No, you stop. <laughs> oh, this will be terrible if you guys can't. Do you know West End Blues? Do you know the cadenza at the very beginning? Um, <laughs> do, 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 do. I will read you a description of this. I'll, this is a description of this 12 second cadenza to the, the beginning of West End Blues. And this is an expert, he, uh, he, uh, this is one of the renowned experts on Louis Armstrong. For me personally, the Western Blues cadenza could have been issued as a record by itself. Like the later Charlie Parker famous alto break, there was a, Charlie Parker was in a recording session and he played, uh, I've forgotten now the tune, the um, Night in Tunisia. And there's a point where the band comes to a stop and he just plays a solo. The first take is this incredibly technically difficult beautiful statement of love and dexterity and of the moment. But they couldn't use the take. It was so, they couldn't use the take, but it was so incredible that it, it eventually got released. You know, they, they messed up at some point later. And Charlie Parker turned to Dizzy Gillespie, I think, and said, I'll never make that break again. And he didn't. The next one he took was very good, but it wasn't this one. That break is famous throughout jazz. Um, Herbie Hancock transcribed it, and I think someone put words to it. Ella Fitzgerald, someone put words to it. It's, it's great. So that's what this writer is referring to. So let me read it again. It could have been issued as a record by itself, like the later Charlie Parker famous alto break. It's like listening to a song with all of its different components, and each time I hear it, something different knocks me out. The opening, descending quarter notes that sound like an alarm clock. The dizzying arpeggios that build to the stirring high concert C. The history of jazz encapsulated in one bluesy run descending blitz of notes that immediately follows the high C, foreshadowing where jazz is going yet firmly rooted in where it's been. And those scattered chromatic phrases sounding so effortless in the hands or chops of an artist who is so completely in command of his horn, it's 12 seconds of heaven. The rest of the record could have consisted of nothing but a yodeler warbling, stick out your can, here comes the garbage man. <laughs> and it would still be a classic just for that. <laughs> I'm sorry I read that because now you want to hear it, right? Yes. Should I take a second? No. Yeah. Oh, you have it? Yeah. Srinidra to the rescue. I don't know. Is it one? Oh, yeah, 1928. Is it the same connection? Uh, yes, the same. She's got a lightning connection, too. But. Here. Oh, you've got it. Jason, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Commercial. Commercial, sorry. <laughs> 
You can skip it in now. So pause it for a second. It's only 12 seconds, so I'm gonna play it again. So again, this is 1928. 1928. <laughs> now he'd been playing around with different elements of it. It's not like he walked in the studio and just did that. This is the thing about jazz. We always say that Charlie Parker had a um, famous saying, first you learn your instrument, then you learn your music. Then you forget all of that and just blow. So there's a lot of preparation that goes into this. And, and again, scholars have dissected this. He, he was working on different parts of that. He, he practiced a lot what clarinetists would play, which is partly why other trumpet players reason he, he had more dexterity than a lot of the other, virtually anyone at that time. But this combination of the, the swing, the change from ba 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 to ba 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 it's different. It was, it was saying something else. It opened up a whole new chapter and it blew people's minds. By the way, to this day, this is, you could write this just as an etude for trumpet players and, the, and a young trumpet player, any pros would have to practice and practice and practice. So let's hear it just one more time. That's phenomenal. Later in the song, he does something that also hadn't been done. The clarinetist takes a solo, and he scats in response to the clarinetist. I'll leave it to you to find it. That's Western Blues. That's a 1928 version. Do you have more that you're going to play? Because I'll get you on our network. I do want to play more, right, yes. Just pull up your settings for me, and I'll, I'll tag you in. Uh, my settings? OK. There you go. I'll do that. You're going to bring that back to me? Yep. I mean, no, no, no. I mean, I know I'm going to get it at the end. But <laughs> <laughs> I know where Sandra Mori lived. <laughs> Um, so, okay, so Armstrong, this is important. I'm, you know, I'm sorry we took that little break. I'm not totally sorry we took that little break, but it's important because literally, I mean, there's so much about Louis Armstrong that you have to say just in terms of popularizing the music, these musical innovations. But you really have one way of playing pre-Armstrong and you have another way after. And what we think of as jazz today comes directly out of Louis Armstrong. This is, this is, there's just not a lot of debate about that. It's extraordinary. That's primarily because of Louis Armstrong. And you will, if you listen to other players of that period, particularly coming out of ragtime and Dixieland and New Orleans jazz, collective improvisation, where you have a lot of people playing, it's beautiful, beautiful music. Thank you. But post Armstrong, there's something different now. Now you have a soloist who does function within the confines of the group, but also steps forward to take the lead kind of like democracy in its search for a balance between individual rights and our collective common good. Get to that in a second. Um, so after Armstrong, we now have what many consider to be the essential elements of jazz from most of the 20th century until today. The blues and blue notes used as a melodic device, a swing phrasing and rhythmic feel, and improvisation using all of those elements. And so when we talk about the development of the music in the 20th century, we always link it to the social, political, economic, or technological landscape, or perhaps to all of these. So remember, recording is now um, becoming extremely affordable for folks. That changes everything. It had implications, of course, for the music business. Publishing sheet music took a hit, although that still continued for most of the century. But recorded music now becomes very important. It's important to us here some 80 years later, of course, because we've got documentation of things. This is not a big revelation that um, changes in the music follow changes in our social, political, technological landscape. It's true for all great art, but jazz in particular has been inextricably linked to the specific experiences of a people and the landscape in which they found themselves. Thus, each major period of jazz is closely linked to the socio-political economic landscape of that time, whether we're talking about the abolition of slavery and the economic opportunities that followed, the Industrial Revolution, the growth of urban centers and the migration thereto in search of jobs, the post-war boom, and the ability of big bands now to work and get jobs, the Civil Rights Movement, the Black Power Movement and other 60s activism, the Reagan years, or if we're talking about the post-Civil Rights, post-Obama period today. The music that was created during these periods is precisely in and, in and of each particular time. 
The best music of each of these periods is still relevant and impactful today, and it's going to take us a while to sort through what will be classics today. It's much easier for us to identify classics pre-1960, quite honestly. I know I'm skipping over a large amount of information that describes and explains the incredible explosion of growth of jazz and its simultaneous transition from being considered illegitimate music performed in brothels and speakeasies to performances in the White House on the world's greatest stages. But I hope you'll follow up with some questions or explore these deeper issues on your own. It's, it's one thing to talk about that change over the course of a century. So you're talking about Jelly Roll Morton, who changed his name to Morton because he didn't want to embarrass his family as a jazz piano player. Yeah. He was from a pretty, it was a middle class family in New Orleans. His actual name is, I don't, I mean, it's a French pronunciation, I'm not going to get it wrong, but he literally changed his name because he was, they were called professor. They played in brothels and just knowing music and having that level of education elevated people, particularly in that kind of context. So you're talking about over the course of 60, 70 years going from that, when I was a young man, um, people would ask you, do you play, do you play jazz or legit? <laughs> Oberlin Conservatory of Music didn't, like many schools, didn't offer a major in saxophone or in jazz in 1978. So we've seen an extraordinary change. Um, today, after an incredible explosion and evolution in the last century, after turmoil and transitions, jazz is kind of a mess. It's kind of a mess, much like our democracy. Seriously. <laughs> There's little agreement over what jazz is and isn't. It's been called a big tent with room for all the variations, interpretations, offshoots, and children and grandchildren. It has. Hip hop has been called a grandchild of jazz. There's some jazz musicians who hate that, actually. It's also been called a very small, tough to get into room that involves standard harmony, melody, rhythms, the blues. That's it. Doesn't have that, it ain't jazz. Of course, there are jazz masters who violated that rule to widespread acclaim, but that never stops us from drawing fences, does it? Jazz has been declared dead by several media outlets and musicians themselves. One of the great young masters of this music, trumpeter Nicholas Payton, wrote a polemic. It's actually, I kind of call it a poem polemic, um, a few years ago titled, On Why Jazz Isn't Cool Anymore. And his first line is, jazz died in 1959. He also has a line that says, jazz is only cool if you don't actually play it for a living. <laughs> So lest you think he is, this is an automatic dismissal of what he says, I, it's actually included in the essays in the catalog. It's, uh, in many ways, it's brilliant. I don't agree with it necessarily fully, but it's provocative, it's profane, um, but it is incredibly thought-provoking and an important piece, I think. It, it, it makes us struggle. He says jazz, is for jazz has become the uh, ground for necrophiliacs. <laughs> we worship the dead, but we hate living jazz musicians. That's, that's kind of harsh, right? But he is, listen, he is a great musician. He is the son, his father was in, um, oh my God, I can't, Preservation Hall Jazz Band in New Orleans. And he is, the, he is one of the young masters. Believe me, he's a very thoughtful guy. And I, I, I told you I love democracy, so I don't mind folks disagreeing with me or my disagreeing with them, uh, particularly if it's thoughtful and we shake hands at the end of the day. So I encourage you to, uh, if you don't have the book, find, you can find it online, Nicholas Payton, on why jazz isn't cool anymore. <laughs> um, but listen, two years ago, 2015, CNN ran an article on its website with their headline, When Jazz Stopped Being Cool. And they cited Nick Payton as well as the following. According to Nielsen's 2014 year end report, jazz is the least listened to music in the US after children's music. The online magazine, The Jazz Line, compiled this statistic. Online music streaming also isn't helping. According to the magazine, jazz was the only genre to have its digital album sales fall between 2011 and 2012. Are you asking the question now? You want me to stop in? Why? I think part of the reason is the first thing we have to establish is baseline. No, no one's paying for music these days. <laughs> We are really in, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Robert Frank's book from maybe, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago, The Winner Take All Society. We're in a context where there are two or three or four superstars in virtually any field. Um, Taylor Swift, right, sells a lot of records. She's, she's somebody, you know, Ka does Kanye West still sell a lot of records? Yeah, Kanye. There are two or three superstars who sell a bunch of records. Everybody else doesn't. So no one's paying for, no one under 50 is paying for recorded music. I still buy CDs. Um, so we have to put it in that context. 
Um, in terms of sales of the music, um, there is a challenge with the attention span of our listening audience below a certain age. I was recently talking to uh, musicians and we did a recording session and as we do these days in the digital context, you always, I, as I was producing the session, so I always like to record more so we can pick and choose. And typically on a CD, you're talking about an hour's worth of music. But we was, I was sitting in the control room and there were all of these LPs lined up. And I said to the guy that I, I think they may have been onto something with the LP, which is roughly around 43, 44 minutes of music. Because I don't know anyone other than myself and a couple of other nerds, if we're in a car, I don't know anyone who listens to an hours of music straight through under the age of 50. Did I leave that part off? <laughs> they just don't do it. They don't do it. E even listening to their music, my nephew is 24, his hip, honestly, it's like they listen to 40 seconds of the music, they know what it is, doing. they're on to the next thing. I was like, how do you? So there, there, there's a combination of factors going on that have led jazz to, you know, people just aren't paying for music that much. I won't leave you, I won't leave you depressed like that. Let me say this. This is, I, I was interviewed for, after this article, everybody was being interviewed on NPR and stuff. Like that. And this is what I say to folks. That is true that we are not selling a lot of jazz, but every other town in this country seems to have a jazz festival. You know, Waynesboro, Wayne, you know, Uncle Joe's backyard has a jazz festival. There's jazz festivals in the summer all over this country, all over this country. Every other university has a jazz studies program. Every university has a jazz radio program or a jazz show, even if it's for a limited amount of time. There's a magazine in New York, a free magazine, it's called Hot House. It lists all of the jazz clubs, different restaurants. If you go back, I happen to have an archive at my disposal. If you go back and look at a Hot House from 1982 when I first moved to New York, it's super thin. You get one now, it's thick. Every restaurant has jazz playing. Now they're not paying cats, and they may not be booking the masters, but there's jazz music being played everywhere. I hear it on commercials. I hear it in soundtracks. So the music is more popular than ever. We haven't figured out the business model yet. This is part of the reason jazz is a mess. Meanwhile, we're educating more and more musicians to go out and do what? Play jazz. Fight for teaching jobs. It's one of the, I'm, gonna, I'm skipping ahead, but one of the, one of the challenges, so I'm talking about jazz being a mess. I think it's a mess right now. Um, an example of it being a mess is that we don't have the apprenticeship model anymore. Most of the training in jazz is done through the academy. So now what does that mean? When, again, I'm, I'm 57, so I'm old compared to they think, but I think I'm still young and cool. Um, <laughs> so in the, in the early 80s, when I, was, when I finished college in 82, um, the guys who were in music school, if you stayed through and got your degree, you weren't in that elite level. The elite players got picked up by Art Blakey. One guy went to become Lena Horne's guitarist. He, he was with her till she passed. Um, Betty Carter always hired young musicians. Dee Horace Silver. Oh, so-and-so got a gig with Herbie Hancock. Oh my God, that's the greatest thing in the world. Now musicians are, you get a big announcement. Oh, so-and-so got the job at Harvard. Oh my God, I can't believe it, it's so great. And this is very different. There, there, there's a curatorial function that went on. Even as those musicians went to find their own voices, they were trained by these older, sometimes crusty cats who were like, you know, no, 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 you tuck your shirt in. You're not coming to the gig like that. You know, what were you? I had a musician who, I shouldn't say too much, he played with, he played with Stanley Turrentine. And Stanley would alter, my understanding, well, no, 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 I'm saying, this is being recorded. I can't, I shouldn't name it. Never mind. Forget that story. No. <laughs> Um, but you learn in that context, even as you go out and try to find your own voice. Miles Davis famously said, it takes a long time to sound like yourself. And that curatorial apprenticeship function that, that playing with the masters provided was very, very important, and that doesn't happen. Um, one very practical application of it is a friend of mine, a great young bassist, he's young, he's 40, <laughs> he said to me recently, my students don't listen to me, they think I'm an old guy, they don't care what I think. And I was just blown away, you know. Um, and the most gifted ones of them will be fine, but the others of them are gonna make music, I think, will, that will not be particularly compelling. And I think that's part of the challenge that we see today with um, some of the music that's being, that's being produced. Um, another problem with jazz is that it seems to have um, little relevance to or for the black community. Right? Okay, that may not be entirely true. I'm being a little provocative, but 
Whenever I ask jazz musicians, scholars, writers, whether or not the black community is relevant to jazz to say, the answer is uniformly no. Now, they all agree that um, African Americans are critical for the creation and de development of the music, but relevant today, not so much. It's also true, by the way, that most of the audience for jazz is white and non-American. So there are implications in there. Some folks argue that it has to do with the accessibility of the music. That is to say, is it danceable? Is it listenable? Um, some of it has to do with when jazz moved from the dance hall to the concert stage. I think those are a little simplistic, but there, there's truth there. Um, there are plenty of black folks who go to the Capitol Jazz for Capitol, uh, this is in D Washington, D.C., or other jazz festivals. Now, those of us who are hardcore, I would say mainstream, straight ahead jazz fans go, and we think, I, as I've said to friends, tell me how this is different from an instrumental R&B festival. <laughs> what, make, what makes this jazz? Um, but that gets back to the challenge of defining what jazz is. Um, for, for those friends of mine, if it's instrumental and there's improvisation, that, that's jazz as opposed to R&B. Obviously, improvisation is not enough. Because there are a lot of improv improvising musicians. There's improvising in classical music. We, a lot of composers got away from it earlier in the 20th century, but particularly later um, in the last century and now, a lot of classical musicians are just simply expected to be able to improvise. Composers always historically uh, created space. The, the cadenza, uh, uh, to a great degree, was usually was improvised. Um, so it's not just improvisation that distinguishes something as jazz, but this is a challenge you get into. But I promise you, you will find African Americans at festivals such as that. Um, and so this is one of the ongoing things that leads me to say, wow, we're a little bit of a mess. Um, there's a disconnect at times between what musicians see as their role as artists and what others of us would call for in terms of their connection to community. So I have musicians who say to me, this is what I have to express myself as an artist. And they rightly, rightly cite masters that we agree on. So they'll say Thelonious Monk, Wayne. Thelonious Monk never changed. People were telling him, oh, your music is so dissonant. People thought that Thelonious Monk couldn't play. They thought he was not technically proficient when he obviously to anyone with ears was. But at the time, he was a very, very controversial figure. And, and so friends of mine say, well, just like Monk, you know, I'm on this, you know, I may be a great artist and you're going to see in 40 years, you know. <laughs> it could be. Um, but I want to say, that I often say to them, well, where, what is it coming out of? I don't, I don't want artists to compromise. But I am deeply connected to artists who are coming out of an experience, who are expressing their hopes and fears. That's what, for me as a non-artist, that's what it does for us. Art allows us to make that inferential step from what is to what can be. Artists always bring something different to the table. Even in, in policy discussions where we don't typically invite artists in, they change things for us. Um, Wendell Pierce, the actor, is a very good friend of mine. And following Katrina, he um, did a performance of Waiting for Godot in Harlem. And they created the stage. The stage was a house partially sub they, said they, they turned the stage into a pool. And it was partially submerged. And if you're familiar with the play, you know there's a character in one spot, and people come by. People came by in boats and rafts. <laughs> Profound. Wendell took that play to the Ninth Ward of New Orleans. This is just a month, a uh, two months after Katrina. Did it outdoors. This was a profound experience. You, you should read the reviews of people who were crying. These, now, this is for the people of New Orleans. Now, this is, we're talking about uh, an African-American community, very, at some points, there are a lot of folks who are upper middle class, but there are a lot of poor folks, too. An outdoor free performance, waiting for Godot, which is not the easiest play to decipher in the world, right? And it, people completely got it. It created a pathway for them to understand what they were feeling and grappling with, and that's, that's what art does. That's what great art always does, and jazz in particular. Um, all of these issues now are roiling in an economic climate where we see students being educated. I should probably stop reading and just open up for questions. We're going to, at some point. Let me, let me get to the democracy part. OK, you get the picture. OK, jazz is often referred to as a metaphor for democracy, rightly so. The notion of the interplay between the individual and the collective, the soloist and the group. At its best, democracy searches for an equilibrium between individual rights and opportunities for the common good. Democracy is the vehicle we as citizens use to come together as equal contributors to a greater collective deliberation process that seeks to simultaneously reflect us, simultaneously, I'm sorry, I like this phrase, I thought I did. 
we as equal contributors come together to engage in a deliberation process that seeks to simultaneously reflect all of us and no one of us. Like jazz, our democracy is kind of a mess right now. Scholars, writers, pundits of every stripe are now struggling to make sense of and interpret the election results. What does it mean for the Democratic Party? How does the Republican Party govern fairly and represent citizens who disagree with it? How can the Democratic Party function when it's so fractured? How does our nation define itself when there are so many divisions along virtually every important issue confronting us? What do we make of the post-Obama surge in overt acts of bigotry and hate? Objective measures including voter turnout, registration, voter confidence all indicate that we have a weakening of our democracy and our public institutions seem particularly vulnerable at this moment. The Democratic Index compiled by the UK-based company that publishes The Economist magazine has downgraded the United States from a full democracy to a flawed democracy in its ranking of 167 nations. Now they define a flawed democracy as, quote, nations where elections are fair and free and basic civil liberties are honored, but may have issues, e.g. media freedom infringement. Nonetheless, these nations have significant faults in other democratic aspects, including underdeveloped political culture, low levels of participation in politics, and issues in the functioning of governance. That's the, that's the United States of America. And this is not some leftist <laughs> this is The Economist magazine. I wish they were leftists. The U.S. was moved in 2016 not because of the election of President Trump, but rather because of the factors that played during that election. The lack of a shared reality in so many basic fundamental aspects of life in our nation today also speaks to a significant degree of disconnection between and among us. To be sure, democracy is by its nature messy and difficult, and to some degree is constantly shifting in its shape and feel. It needs a lot of care feeding, and attention. Like jazz, it requires of its practitioners a deep attention to history and tradition alongside a willingness to move past both and even challenge them, albeit thoughtfully. Like jazz, it requires practice, diligence, commitment, and a willingness to admit and learn from past mistakes. Like jazz, it asks that we consider ourselves as much as we might consider others. I'm sorry, that we consider others as much as we might consider ourselves that we treat the shared goal as seriously as we treat our personal ones, and that we sometimes support the other soloists and stay in the background. All of these make for a very depressing situation as we sit here today. Um, jazz and our democracy are a mess. It's really horrible. And yet, and yet, I'm hopeful. I remain hopeful. I am what Cornell West calls a prisoner of hope. <laughs> he uses that phrase, he says, um, Optimism, optimism is when you look out and there's some grains of things that you can hold on to and say, uh, yeah, things are going to get better. Hope is when you look out and there is absolutely no reason at all to think things are going to get better and go on, but you do anyway. I'm actually cheating a little bit here because I do think there are some things to look at and see. I have reason to be hopeful, at least for jazz, at least for jazz, because we have the blues. The blues is different from depression. The blues are a part of life. The blues have an ebb and flow to them. You can get over the blues. You can sing the blues, but you still get up and go to work the next day. You can sing the blues about a lost love and find another. It's not depression. And in jazz, we swing. And that's no small thing. <laughs> I didn't have that written down. <laughs> OK, wait, wait, wait. OK, I got, I got two sentences. I want to close on this sentence. Um, in jazz, we have a lot of people with shared values working hard together to create beauty in an open, collective manner. Democracy just needs the blues, and it needs a lot of different people working hard together to create beauty in an open, collective manner, and it needs to swing. Thank you. So, Allison, we have time for questions. Allison has the mic. This is being recorded, so I... I, I you, by coming in here, you all give your consent to be on uh, video. That's a typical thing. I don't know if they handed it off for you. You do need to speak into the mic, though, yes, so sir. they can hear you. Mayor, Mayor Connors. Yes, sir. Good to see uh, you, sir. That was wonderful. I just Thank wanted you. to tell you that. And we are so proud of our jazz community here and in the Poconos. And you and I talked about Phil Woods. And so Keith Jarrett was raised in right up the road. Anyway. Uh, I just wanted to pass on to you a film that I've watched about five times already. 
uh, that's terrifically educational. It's called Cadillac Blues, oh. about Muddy Waters and the rise of uh, the blues. And the other thing I wanted to mention, that uh, the fellow that was the main mentor to Keith Jarrett, the jazz pianist, lives two blocks away from here in a Jewish home. His name is John Coates, familiar to many people wow. here. Yep. And uh, he, he was influenced by Art Tatum and Bill Evans. Wow. So you would, you would like to pick up John Coates. Anyway, that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. No, that's, that, that's, a, that's very important. So, so while you're finding the next person, let me jump in and say, so Keith Jarrett obviously is one of the greats a lot. Um, there is a very interesting documentary on Keith Jarrett, because he's a bit of a character. But in it, they have um, a program from his, I think he's, I want to say maybe nine or ten. He's a child, his recital, that this teacher. And the last, the last tune is an improvised thing that he wrote. It's like zoo, it, its title is like Zoo Animals or something. But what nine or ten year old in those days has like, a, but his teacher allowed him to do that and obviously encouraged him. And it's, this is the result. That's a great legacy. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. You said that um, in that uh, poll that the jazz was no longer considered popular. That's, that's actually not a poll. That, that, those well, are sadly actual sale results. Yeah. Sales. yeah. What is? Oh, uh, well, pop music, country music has always been extremely popular. Even with the black population? No, 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 no. Oh, okay. I mean, there are black folks who love country music. I grew up in the South. And I, now, when I say country music, so, and you have to, country music is going through its thing. So there's country music now that's post, I call it the sort of post Garth Brooks. Very popular. It's, it's borrowing heavily from a lot of different musics. It's great. I mean, it borrows heavily from hip hop, from rock and roll. Um, pre that, if you're talking about down home country music, Hank Williams. Um, all of the folks that were on Hee Haw. Many of these were great artists. Glenn Campbell, he's a great artist. Um, and a, <laughs> I used to watch Hee Haw on Saturday night. Yeah. Uh, and there were only a couple of channels, you know. Uh, yes, a lot of black folks watched Hee Haw, y'all, at six o'clock, I think. Lawrence Welk was a different story. Um, but, but, um, 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 wait, your question was, oh, but so, so country music has always had a lot, a lot of popularity. Uh, that's quietly kept. There, there are more country, I think country music is the most played music on the air, radio airwaves. Um, the, the, the commerce, I didn't talk about the art versus commerce piece, but th this is a challenge um, for jazz. Um, it is a challenge overall in the music industry because I, I don't see that anyone has really figured out the business end of it online. Um, if we were to open up the internet and truly let the artists go directly to their audience, which a lot of folks do, if you look at indie rock, for example, I think some of those young people have done a masterful job of carving a niche for themselves. It costs very, very little to make a good record these days. That's one of the great benefits of digital technology. So a lot of the indie rock folks and some of the folks I like, you know, they're, they're not trying to sell a million copies. They're not, they don't need to sell a million copies. They don't have a big corporation to support. They sell 30, 40, 50,000. Worldwide, they're in hog heaven, you know. Um, it's it's it, you know it's in jazz. Jazz has always been that way. You know, we get it got distorted a lot by the popularity of rock and roll. But um, you know, back when major labels were important, were I mean they're still important. Let me not say that. But if you sold twenty thousand units, you were you got re-signed. Your record label never dropped you. Just twenty thousand, twenty thousand. Diana Crawl, Diane Reeves, um, I'm trying to think of other singers who jazz, they sell, they'll sell 100,000, 150, 200,000. They're big superstars. But uh, Branford Marcellus told me um, he started his own record label right after he'd left Sony. Um, and he says his, the first one he did on, at that time anyway, on his record label, I believe he said it sold something like, I don't know, 2,500, 3,000 units. He says, Wayne, my last CD for Columbia sold like 2,200. So much for the vaunted marketing machine of, uh, of our friends in corporate America. Yes, sir. I loved your presentation. Thank you. Uh, however, I expected to hear more about my second favorite composer, Gershwin. Ah. I'm wondering if you would take maybe three minutes and just connect the jazz to Gershwin? Well, I mean, this is, it's a great question. You're, and Gershwin is your favorite composer? Second. Second. Who's your f Ellington. That's a secret. Ah. <laughs> we kind of know now. Um, 
No, the Gershwins, I mean, this is the wonderful thing about, about jazz, particularly as we look at the 20th century. It's so closely related to the growth of American art form. It's so closely related to the American songbook, Tin Pan Alley, Broadway. The Gershwins, um, obviously extremely influenced by what was happening up in Harlem, uh, by what Duke Ellington was doing, by the striped pianists that they heard. You know, excellent, um, I'm saying. Um, the Gershwins, Ira didn't write so much music. Ira wrote, was more on the lyric side, uh, but they both knew music very well. Um, profoundly influenced, and so what I like is that, again, they were breaking rules at the time. They were saying, okay, I'm gonna write this classical piece. Mm, I'm gonna call it Rhapsody, but I'm gonna throw some blues in, or what feels like blues. I'm gonna break some conventions melodically. I'm gonna have some open passages where the pianists can improvise. I'm gonna borrow heavily from jazz, but I'm gonna perform it on the concert stage, you know? Um, and so all of their, um, th there was this incredible melting pot of ideas going back and forth. One of the, the cornerstones of jazz improvisation are what are called rhythm, you just call them rhythm changes. And rhythm changes is the harmonic structure of the tune, I Got Rhythm. You cannot call yourself a jazz musician and not be able to play rhythm changes. It's just that ubiquitous. And that's from George Gershwin. But I, there are so many variations of rhythm changes. That's what you just call them rhythm changes. You know, all their altered rhythm changes. Or it's rhythm changes with the cycle of fifths bridge. Or rhythm changes with an altered, it, we, it never goes to a bridge. It just cycles back and forth. Um, the Gershwins are incredibly important, and jazz is incredibly important to them. Is that good? Not three minutes. <laughs> so, so, do you think that, I'm not trying to shut you down, <laughs> is, is, is the archive going to be the main symbol of jazz? Oh, that's is, a great question. Is, um, will jazz still uh, influence, or does it, other so, so it's so the, the talk was supposed to be jazz and democracy. So I'm going to say, and so because we can apply that same question: Is democracy dead in this country right now? Um, there are there are a lot of reasons to think that's the case. I think the answer is no. I'm going to well, I, when we when we absolutely finish, I'm going to I was going to tell you why. I'm going to play you something. Why? What I'm going to play you is a, a 16 year old singer. Um, and she just sort of epitomizes, I think. It's so funny, when I was younger, I would hear young people, I would hear older folks talking about, oh, the kids are our future, blah, 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 blah. I was like, but you're not gonna, you're not letting me run stuff. You know, you keep telling us, you keep telling us, you know, we're, you know, we're the hope for the future. Why don't you make me president of the university, for God's sake? Um, but now I'm that person. Um, and I'm not gonna let them run the university. Um, but I do think w when I hear a lot of these young folks, so talking about jazz, one of the great things about, uh, and I call this the post Winton Marsalis effect, one of the great things about jazz being so much in the academy um, is that there are excellent young musicians coming out now. I mean, it's just, to me, it's astonishing. There, there are so many great programs at the junior high and high school level. If you pick up, go pick up Branford Marsalis' first record. He's going to hate that I'm doing it. Pick up Branford Marsalis' first record, which is wonderful. But he sounds choppy. But da, 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 da. he hasn't. He's not swinging hard yet. But you do, baby. But he's not there yet. You go listen to the best kid at their local high school jazz band. They sound, in terms of their rhythmic sense, in terms of being able to play changes, they're better than my generation was at that age. It's not even close at that. I don't know that they're more creative. Some of the kids are worried that they're not having as much fun as we did. They seem so serious. You know, they're, they're so serious on the bandstand. And I was like. You, aren't you playing to that pretty girl in the front row? What are you? Um, so, but I, I hopefully they'll sort that out. Those kids are so prepared to, once they find their voice, once they find a way of not playing the stuff that I like. I like it when they play stuff from my generation. But they have to find their own path. Um, I think they're going to do great things. I think they're going to figure their way out of it. I really trust artists. On the democracy side, I heard this activist. I was at um, a, an SCLC meeting. S uh, yeah, CLC meeting back in the 80s. And this older white woman was getting an award from the Civil Rights Organization, Ann Braden, I think is her name. And an extraordinary woman, I'll never forget this. And she said, I have great belief, great belief in the power of people to organize on their own behalf. And I was like, that's deep. I mean, this is a woman who used to hide civil rights workers in her home. You know, the Black Panthers wanted to honor her, you know. 
And so with respect to democracy, I, I think as messy as things are with the Occupy movement, um, Black Lives Matter, I think, has done such, they've done such extraordinary things, even with all the bad press they get. My generation, I mean, this group came, I don't know when exactly they were formed, but very quickly, they had an impact on the Democratic National Party's platform in a positive way. They didn't have crazy stuff that they threw at them. It was very progressive, open things. We didn't have, we weren't there. Um, we haven't done a good job of transmitting knowledge and organizational, you know, so we keep wanting to have like goals and like a 10 point plan and like a structure that we can recognize and they're not going to do that because they're kids, you know. Um, but I have a lot of faith in that. I, I, I really do. And I think um, we're not doing a great job. We're doing a much better job of educating young jazz musicians than we are in terms of educating young civic participants. Um, and that's that's where we have problems. I mean, that's where, th this is what I mean when I say, I, I'm, I'm, I, I mean, I, I hope it didn't sound flippant, but when I say jazz needs, the blues jazz needs swing, it needs everyone. It needs women. It needs people of color. It needs poor folks running for office. We've got to figure out a way to, I think, to publicly fund our elections. We have to move towards public. We'll never get money out. We'll never. We have to make, we have to make, you know, the cable outlets and television, we have to make them run political ads for free. We have to do, I mean, we're not going to get money out of it otherwise. And once we do that, then we're going to, we will to some degree lessen the impact of money. And we can have a conversation about why we think people who are rich are smarter than the rest of us. I mean, that's, I have my, I grew up in the South, I have friends from high school, this is, he's a whack job, but he's, a, he's a, in his heart, he's a nice guy, he really is. Uh, he's a complete right wing. I'm, he, this is my boy from high school. He posts all the time, and he'll he, a premise will be, Donald Trump is a billionaire. Therefore, he must. No, he's a. I'm not saying that about our president. <laughs> the, but there are challenges. There are challenges just because we think that just because someone is rich, they have better ideas than, you know, my plumber, who's a really bright, interesting guy. And boy, if he had ever, you know, so. I, 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 I am hopeful. I don't know. I don't know. I left this part out. I, did, I, I glossed over this part. We have to work. That's the thing. We, we, I don't know what will happen. I know what will happen if those of us who care deeply, who, who, who don't mind difference, don't mind difference. Listen, I'm, I'm pretty far left, but I definitely don't want all of my decisions. To be, I, I want to bounce something off my conservative friends and make sure I'm not just going off the rails here. We need each other. We, 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 we need each other. We need all of us to be as informed as possible. We, we need all of us to consider one another. And if we who believe that don't do it, we absolutely won't make it. We still might not because we're in a pickle. But anyway, thank you. agree with everything that you've said, especially that um, we're in a pickle, but we're going to hang in there, and we're going to, win, and it's, it's, it's in our, this pickle is in our hands, and um, what we have uh, is what, um, what uh, Wayne has is hope, and what a fictional character that I read recently uh, in the book called The Symp uh, uh, Sympathizer by a, a Vietnamese guy, very, very wry and very brilliant author, called, uh, the, 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 um, the main character has killed a couple of people in the United States and so he has to go back to Vietnam, be, you know, to hide out. So what the things that he's going to miss are uh, things like TV dinners, um, uh, good traffic laws that people really really obey and but the most the wonderful the most thing that he the thing that he's going to be missed the most is what he calls the ever present narcotic hope so we've got to have that yeah. you can't disappoint <laughs> don't forget uh, next uh, uh, October 6th uh, Maury will be speaking on C-Session and uh, uh, Nullification. <laughs> we 
we don't remember that word so much. But anyway, we'll see you um, before then and then. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes, I'm going to.